back for the second annual Carolina Kiko Classic in Asheville, North Carolina. And if you watched last year, we got to talk with Dr. Ann and we did an interview about her bringing over the first four bucks from New Zealand here to the States. And she told us a lot about her life and the places she has been. So I'll leave a card right up here and you can go back and watch that video. It's very interesting and it's amazing the things that she has done and done them with goats and everywhere that she's lived but today i thought would be a good time since it's the second annual we'll actually go a little bit more in depth about those bucks and what she liked about them and what each one of them brought to her farm and of course they've been dead for how many years is the last one um, that, well, they died when they were 14 years old. Oh, wow. So they lived a long time. 89. Yeah, they were born in 89 and lived 14 years. 14 years. So 14 year old bucks. That says something about their genetics, their lineage, and of course the way you took care of them as well. Yeah. yeah. I made sure they were safe. And yeah. After the investment, I'm sure, after from the bringing invest them back yeah. over, right? And, and running out of money. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> So we're going to start off and it's going to be informal and uh, we're just going to allow Dr. Ann uh, to tell us a little bit about and I have some notes and some questions here on my phone so if you see me looking down that's what I'm doing I'm looking through so that I don't forget anything. So what were, how were they named or numbered or what were the names of those first four bucks that came over here? Okay, the, the first four bucks their names were Gotex um, 2689, then Gotex 2289, Gotex 6289, and Gotex 1489. And can you explain how they came up with that numbering system? I think I know, but can you tell the camera or everybody oh. how they came up with that? Yeah, that was Garrett Batten's numbering system. And they basically, when they came in off of the mountain, as they came in, the, those kids were given numbers. Um, and my goal, I told him uh, that I wanted four goats and that I was going to pick the best four. Awesome. So, so they, the, whichever one rambled in the 14th was number 14 and the 89 was the year they were born. Is that and they time? were all born in 1989 that kidding that he had and you know their seasons are opposite to ours right so they're getting ready to go into spring now okay so of those four bucks and you can tell us about all of them or you can pick a you know one or two of them but what attributes did those four bucks bring or did you think they were going to bring to your herd when you chose them in New Zealand well, the first attribute that I was really interested in is that they were up on a mountain in really bad weather and they were out working on a, a big gorse project that um, Garrick Batson had going on. And um, they were all out there. My main goal was the fact that they were out there working, all the whole mob of kids, they were all out there working. The weather was horrible. It was um, raining and it was cold, um, and they they were doing great. Their moms were with them, um, and that was one of my characteristic traits. I was really, I really wanted good moms, and I wanted to see the kids so I knew what their moms uh, offered to them, and then um, being able to pick out the kids that you know had a good depth of heart girth and. It's hard sometimes to pick them when they're little. Yeah. But looking at their legs, I was really interested in their legs. Um, really strong legs and inside leg muscling on the little kids. Um, they had to have nice testicles and um, no crypt orchids. They had to, testicles had to be the same size and only two teeth on the little bucklings. And um, then I was hoping. Right. You know, that they would bring a lot of those traits along with meat characteristics to my goats that I was working on. 
at the time that you went and got those four bucks, how many does did you have that you wanted to bring them back to? Um, just over 700. And was that before you'd done your major culling? Or yes. Okay, so you had 700 and then you culled, I think you said in a talk today, down to 300 or 350 350. Or something? Yeah, because I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get bucks. And so I would just have used the bucks I had at that time. But once I knew that these guys were, you know, in the air, flying headed in. Headed this way. Headed, headed into the Hawaiian Islands from New Zealand. Then I started calling. So you brought those bucks into Hawaii. Yes. And that's where you started your first breeding there, was in Hawaii with those four, four bucks. Yeah, right? they had to stay in quarantine for a month. So they were, in, they were in quarantine, and then I shipped them to the big island on a barge. And so and then I just said, okay, boys. You gotta, you gotta do some work. You're gonna do work. And so for the first breeding, they all went out. And I said, well, if there's anybody that I really, really like as far as females, I would DNA test them because I had a DNA account at um, UC Davis. Wow. So I could do my own, and at that time they pulled blood. So I could... Could discern who the father actually yeah, was. Yeah, who needed. the father was. And then, and I had also started, because I had been on the ranch for over a year, I had started ear tagging some of the better does. And so, because none of them had ear tags, so I started ear tagging them. And um, so I kind of knew at some at one point possibly the dads were, but the DNA tested them. So after you did your DNA testing, did you find that one of them did better or did more for a certain type dough than the other, or did they all just end up kind of equally helping everything out? Well, it was pretty interesting because the um, the 62 buck. Um, 6289. He had a really deep heart girth, great springer rib, and um, you could see his um, hindquarter muscle. So his little kids that he, you know, after a DNA test, you know, his little kids came back with those characteristic traits, but I knew they were only F1s. Right. So I knew whoever I kept that the next year they they would you know improve the kids that were bred to 2289 they were long and that's one of the things he's always done he, he does a good spring of rib but he really stretches them out like from the point of their shoulder to their pin bone he really put length on them uh 22 no 62 2689 getting confused oh yeah of course 2689, that was the black one. He was an interesting goat. He was really smooth muscle. He was just put together really well. He was smooth through the neck and shoulders, nice top line, bottom line, and he had a, a really nice rump. Um, and he was um, more, he was a very aggressive eater. He was, you'd see him most of the time standing on his hind legs, trying to get up a tree. And, it, and it, those little kids were really interesting because that was another trait I was looking for was being bipedal. Yeah. And then 1489, I always called him my sleeper. Because um, <coughs> I, I knew that I would have used these three bucks and then I was thinking, now what am I going to do on their F1 kids? So I thought, okay, I'm going to hold back on um, 1489 and use him to come back on my F1s from the three bucks. And um, he chunkied them up. Really? Yeah. He really made them wide across the withers and he stretched out their rumps, you know, across the hips nice pelvic cradle and um, he had really a wide chest and really nice legs 
That's a, I always called him a sleeper. So it sounds like you had something for everything that you could see in your herd, a buck that would fix a little bit of all of it. Is that by plan or did you get a little bit lucky too? I know you spent time looking at them, but they were small when you picked them I, out. They were small, yeah, they so were did young. You, did you kind of get, you think, lucky, and so to speak, a little bit, or did just every, the Kiko itself was generally good enough, or those bucks were generally from good enough stock that they just helped no matter what? Well, they were, they were from really good stock. He had been doing this for quite a few years when I went down. But I think, um, I think I just made some right decisions and gambled. Oh yeah. It was, you know, it's a pretty big gamble. Oh yeah, of course. So, and you know, you just cross your fingers and hope you made the right choice. And then over the years, you start looking at the dough base and seeing more and more what those bucks put into that dough base. And then, um, I started keeping some of their offspring back. I had everybody collected. I flew a semen processor in from uh, California. Frozen Assets came in. Twice I flew her in. And um, she collected the, the four boys. And then I had some really nice kids from each of those. Um, they weren't necessarily they weren't the best kids, but they, they were just really average kids. But, and that's how I've always looked at them. I want average animals, just a little bit above the whole herd average, and then start selecting them to bring the rest of the herd up to speed. And um, so I started selecting some really nice, you know, offspring for them. So it's a good time, I guess, since you mentioned that you had them collected. Do you still have semen on those four bucks? Yes. Do you sell any of that semen? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, so and if you're interested in it, they can contact you through Goats Unlimited. Is that right? Goats Unlimited at gmail.com. Goats Unlimited at gmail.com. If you're interested, she still has semen from the first four original bucks that ever came to the States, which is amazing to me that you can still add that to your herd. It's pretty yes. awesome. I went back this year, I did an AI program, and I went back to um, 62 and 26. Did you, have you ever collected any of their sons, or have you yes. used any of their sons in AI as well? Or? Yes, I used um, Built Unlimited 4508 this time, and I, who else did I use? Um, 4511. So I used um, a 62 and a 26 son. So I know that we've talked about it. I'm not sure we talked about it in the last video, but your herd is a closed herd. Is that correct? Yes. And that means that you don't bring any outside animals, live animals in at all to your herd. Am no, I correct you're in saying correct. that? Yes. But I have heard you add different shots of genetics occasionally through AI. Is that right? Yes. So you do once in a while, if you need a shot of something or want to try something, you will bring in another buck, but it's through AI only. Through AI only. Okay. Yeah. And I always buy a couple of straws because I want to test the semen for, um, especially Cape Green arthritis, because CAP can go through the freeze. Really? Yes. So I want to make sure that I've got my semen to go. I did not know that. I learned something today for sure. Yeah. That's so. Wow. Yeah. If I buy straws, I always buy two. Uh. So let's see. Oh, and I also originally brought in uh, the generator buck, but I brought him in as semen. He came in from um, Texas. The gentleman who purchased Generator and Moneymaker. When he sold, he sold the, he was selling his tank of semen, I bought it. Okay. That was Generator. He never had Moneymaker collected, Moneymaker died. And then I also brought in Sesame and Sting out of New Zealand. Do you still have any semen on those animals? Generator. Generator? But not the other two. No. I didn't get very many straws 
some of the other two that came in. Okay. All right. So I guess in looking back, and we always are kind of backseat drivers, but we've talked about this question and I kind of proposed it to you. Is there anything that you would have changed when you can go back in your mind and think about those little bucks running around? Sorry, we're at the airport, but is there anything that you would change? Would you wish you ever wondered if you'd have picked, you know, number 65 instead of 62, or were you totally just really happy the way it all worked out? Um, I was happy the way it all worked out. I do exactly again what I did. That's awesome. Yeah. That says a I'm, lot too, you know, to for you to say, yeah, I'm happy with it. I, yeah, I was real happy. I mean, the, the kids, when the kids were hitting the ground, I was jumping up and down. You knew um, you'd hit a home run, right? I hit a home run and it was a gamble. I mean, it was a big gamble. That was all the money. I sold my house in Alaska to, to buy four bucks and some airplane tickets. And, you know nobody okay. really under, I don't know that we even talked about that last I don't know that I really even knew that you know we've kind of, we've become really good friends over the last year since the first time we talked but I didn't realize that you really mortgaged the house so to yep, speak I sold it yes I did to be able to to afford to purchase those to purchase those guys because we had to go from the South Island to the main island of New Zealand so that was, besides buying the bucks, we had to go through all the health stuff, health quarantine in New Zealand. Then they had to go from one island to the next. That was a barge ride. Then they had to, and then they make you go through quarantine again on the um, main island of New Zealand. Then you have to go on Air New Zealand, because that's their main like livestock transport wow. out of New Zealand to um, Honolulu. And so, and they have to land on international tarmac, which means you have to have an international carrier pick them up, take them to the quarantine station. They stay in quarantine for 30 days. Then they had they were taken back to the then they were taken to the pier, and they went from the pier in Honolulu. Then they went to Kauai on the Big Island where I picked them up. So. From the time you said, okay, those are the four I want, how long did it take you to pick them up and start to be able to take them to your farm? Three months. And three months worth of money, too. And three months worth of money. That was a big gamble, Dr. Ann. That was yeah. amazing. It was a big gamble. Yeah. Wow. I, I had to do some... Uh, thinking and praying on uh -huh. that one. I'm sure you did. That's, that's because crazy. Because I knew if it was a mistake, I was out a lot of money. Yeah. And it was all the money I had. Wow. Because the ranch I lived on, I just lived there. You know, help them take care of their animals. Let's see. That, that's amazing. I guess it's a good time to ask then. Oh, well, you know, being a gamble, but they paid for my farm. Yeah, I paid my farm off for, or, this will be the fifth year. They, they paid my farm off five years ago. So it's all worked out. It, it all worked out. And in the meantime, I flew them from Honolulu to California on an L-1011. Did, along with a mob of goat, those, did all the browsing projects there and then they I was there for seven or eight years and then came to Tennessee. So how many how many does do you think you brought? I know you brought your four bucks because you wasn't leaving them, but how many does did you bring from Honolulu to California with your bucks? Over just probably right about three fifty to four hundred. I'd have to look in my records. Too. Oh my goodness. That was a lot of money to move those, was it not? Yeah, just from Honolulu to um, San Francisco was $29,000. That was another gamble, yeah. But you were able to do a lot of the fire prevention? I did a lot of fire work. They did a lot of fire yes, work. Yes, you just All their kids. managed them while they did it. Yeah, and then I sold a lot of meat for offspring. Right. 
I'm amazed. I'm just amazed by your your ability to think that far ahead and to take a chance, which I think you're a risk taker in general. I mean, you've lived all over the world yeah. and you've done lots of different things that people would love. So you're not one to just sit back and not take risks. I mean, that's in your DNA. It's in your it, DNA. It's in my DNA. Yeah, it's yeah. in your DNA. You're going to have my DNA tested. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it would say risk taker right yeah. at the top for sure. <laughs> so I guess it's a good time to say, uh, why did you think, why Kikos? How did you hear about them and why did you think they were the answer? <clears throat> well, when I originally, I had, I had a friend in New Zealand, his name was Chris Neal, and he worked for Landport. And he thought, I, with the does that I had, I should, should come over and get boar goats. And I said, okay. So, once again, off I go to New Zealand, and um, I stayed with um, Ron and Sue Cornelius, who were managing and ran the Cary Cary Station for Landport. And every night we'd sit around the dinner table eating lamb with mint jelly. Oh, oh it was so was good. It good. Oh, it was good because Sue was a, an excellent cook. <laughs> and Ron used to tell me that I was the most expensive guest he ever had because I could pack lamb away. <laughs> but You um, do like meat, you've said several oh, times. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm a meat eater. So we went out. I spent a lot of time with them looking at the boar goats, looking at the kids, helping them, you know, clean the feeders and helping them do the kidding. And we, I just spent a lot of time there. And one night we were sitting down talking and Ron said, you don't want boar goats. I said, Ron, I've been here for a couple of weeks and now I don't want them? No, because of the dough base that you have. He said, you need Kikos. I said, okay. I didn't even know what Kikos were. Right. So he made a phone call to Garrick Batten and Garrick said, yeah, come on down. And we went and looked at Angoras. We went and looked at Kashmir. Um, we went to the warehouses where they, you know, store the fiber and look at the fiber and to make sure I was really interested in the Kikos. He, he showed me other breeds and um, once I got on the top of that hill and I saw those kids working, I went, that's me, right up there. You could just tell that they were what I wanted. hardy and what you wanted. Yeah, and... because I didn't see that in the boar kids at all. And they were, you know, they were, they were eating gorse, which is a very toxic plant there. And the little kids were eating all the thorns off of it and the little flowers. And I'm thinking, I have a place for them where I live in the islands. Exactly. You knew exactly what you were going to do with really. them. Yeah. Because they were at the same level um, in topography and latitude where I was back in, in, on the big island. How many breed? I know you saw a difference in those goats, the first, the F1s. But when did you really see, like, was it the F1 or was it later that you looked back and said, yeah, I got it. I, I can see the major change in what I wanted. Probably the third, I'm trying to think of what years it would have been. It would have been the third, the third generation, because you know, generation intervals are about four years. So it would have been about the third generation. But see, in Hawaii, I kid it what they call accelerated kidding, where I kidded three times in two years. Yeah. So um, it might have even been the fourth generation because of that accelerated kidding. Um, that's when I was sitting out in the field with my ham and cheese on rye, and I have a friend on uh, Maui, <coughs> my friend Hortense, or Joaquin, who's, she's been through 22 kiddings with me. We were sitting out there and we both looked at each other at the same time as we're looking at the kids and we went, we've got really nice kids. Yeah, you could just tell that it was. You can just tell that it, pay, it paid off. That's amazing. Yeah, and then when I paid off the farm five years ago, even the boys were dead, I think. Right, of course, because they're still, 
They're it, still in my semen tank. Yeah, they're still there. They're yeah. still the lineage that brought you to where you're at. And I still go back to them. You know, some of their, you know, maybe seven or eight generations away, I can still go back to those old boys and really bring some, some back, more of that back. back forward. So you yeah. really, you don't have to do it every year, but when you get to that point, you say, okay, I need to bring a few of those boys back. You're able to yep. do that. I do that, and I do it. I do it every year because I do my own AI. Right. And so, and I've used some of their sons, and I've really been happy with them. That's neat. That's so, neat. And I sell that semen for very. If people want to try them, I don't. I sell it for thirty dollars a straw. Wow. So they can they can try them and see how they do on their animals. That's amazing. That's wonderful. So, so she's got sons of those. And they're thirty dollars a straw. Thirty dollars a straw. Hey, Goats Unlimited G at gmail.com. Gmail you can contact her for. You said you had uh, Goliath. No. Generator. Generator. I get all the yes. G's mixed up. Yeah. Generator. So you you brought generator. In, but in, I bought him from. Um, I'm trying to. Frank Dyson. So she brought gener. She bought generator, which she still. Was a was a New Zealand buck? Is he, that he, correct? Yeah, Frank Dyson bought Generator and Money Maker. They were New Zealand bucks. Right. And um, Frank Dyson lived in Texas. I'm trying to remember the name of this farm. Frank Dyson. Frank Dyson. I mean, that's been years. Yeah. Um, and he just called me up one day and he said, you know, I'm going to sell my semen tank and everything that's in it. And I said okay and what would you like for it he told me and i said okay put it on fedex and send it then when i opened it up and it was full i wanted to fall over <laughs> it was it was like full of generator semen i said okay i'm fine okay i did well right, another gamble so another gamble that worked out for her. so if you're interested in some of the old lineage old line first new zealand's Dr. Ann is the place that you can get it. You can bring those into your herd with the semen and some AI. If you have questions, you can always shoot her an email about Kiko's. Uh, like I say, go back and watch the first video. It's amazing to see what a risk taker she was and where she's lived all over the world. Uh, Dr. Ann, I just want to say thank you for allowing me to do these videos. Oh, you're more than welcome. Uh, it has been my pleasure to get to know you the last year. I hope, I mean, I've, it's just been amazing to become your friend, and I think of you as a friend. And it's been wonderful, more than goats. You know, it's just been really great. Is there anything we missed that you might want to add about those four, or keep those in general? Well, I, I do want to say I do AI clinics. If anybody wants to do, uh, learn how to do artificial insemination, um, we did one in Coleman, Alabama. I do want, I don't want it for my farm every year, except this year I had I canceled this year's. But I do one at my farm every year. Um, I did one in Coleman, Alabama. I did one in Gray, Tennessee. I'll be going to Carrollton, Georgia next year. And other than that, I, I'm not exactly sure where all we're gonna go, but. AI clinics, if you want to learn how to do, would you call it cervical? It's cervical. Cervical AI. Yeah. Uh, it's a technique that she can teach anyone. I've watched one and been kind of involved in one of her classes. Right. Yeah, you have. And uh, learned so much. Wealth of knowledge, that's for sure. If you have any questions or you're looking for uh, an AI or artificial insemination class, just send Dr. Ann an email at goatsunlimited at, at gmail.com. You can keep an eye on her website, but she's kind of like the rest of us. She says she doesn't keep it up the greatest, but you, you can send her an email asking questions about classes, send her emails asking about, you know, semen. You may want to bring some of that semen, I'm telling you that's, of course, it's been proven to be good stuff. As always, guys, hey, we'll do it all again tomorrow and be back here next year for Carolina Kiko Classic number three. Number three. Fletcher, North Carolina, and Definitely another interview with Dr. Ann. And you and you gotta come. Um, I've looked through all the goats here, and there's really nice goats here. Really, Kikos, really, really nice, nice Kikos here. There's so if really you, nice Kikos. If you've not been to the Carolina Kiko Classic, 
to make plans for number three in October of next year, I'm sure. Yep. Thanks again for letting oh, yeah. me do this interview. Thank you for asking me all those questions. I, and, I, and also being a friend. Well, exactly. That's the main thing is I've, I've met a friend and I really do appreciate that. Yep, I appreciate yeah. you and your family too. Yeah. All right, guys. Thanks a lot. Thanks a million. We'll do it all again tomorrow. Yep. Bye. Bye-bye.